Word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us. What a blessing it is to be able to be here. And we just ask for your favor here. And we just ask that you would just help us to, to understand uh, this valuable lesson that we have before us of faith and of dependence. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' powerful name, we do pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 We are working out of a book. Uh, it's the, the Life of Messiah, Yeshua, the Life of Messiah. Yeshua is Jesus in Hebrew. And uh, we're, num we're at 5 of 197, so it, we should be there, finished right before the rapture happens. Okay, I'm not too sure. Anyway, a um, couple of things that I want you to... Last week we talked about something, and uh, what I want us to always remember is that we're, we're going to be actually be putting these and posting these paintings up on the wall so that I want you to be able to go up to a painting or up to one of these on the wall and know exactly all the information that's wrapped up into that. In other words, as you're looking at that, you can go ahead and start thinking in terms of, oh yeah, I remember that story. I remember how that worked. I remember how he got there. I remember what happened to him, who talked to him, things like that. So it's really important for us to be able to have a review kind of in a sense. So that, that wall that we're gonna have over there is gonna be a wall of review as well. So that's going to be going. The first one that we had, the first plaque that we have, we gave to Cammie cause to, as, a, as, a, as a get well gift. And so it worked because she's here. So praise the Lord for that. Okay. <laughs> so if you're ever ill, call me. We will give you. Joshua will do a painting and then he will we'll send it to you and then you'll be fine. Okay. So that's the way it works. This time around, we are talking about uh, something that's something somewhat similar, actually. Uh, in, this, in this painting, you'll see that uh, what we have is Zechariah. We see Gabriel, and uh, Gabriel is telling him uh, some very basic information, and that is that you are supernaturally going to have a child. And in this case, what he did is he says, uh, you're, even though you're, you're past of age, your wife is past of age, you can't, for all intents and purposes, have any children, you are going to have a son and goes on to give him all the information. But he just got stuck on the first part of that, <laughs> which uh, where he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're saying I'm going to have a son? You know, I'm way past the age, over 60, you know, and there's no way that we're going to have one. And so when he comes back and he questions the Gabriel, then, then Gabriel says, oh, okay, just for that kind of attitude that you've got, you're not going to be able to speak. And then later on we find out that they're having to make signs so he can't even hear. And so that was because of his unbelief. So here you have a guy who, uh, you know, wants to tell the whole world <laughs> what's taking place, but, you know, he'll have to write it down for right now. So that's taken place. That's already, that's already gone down the line. And now we're kind of fast forwarding six months from this event because now at this point in time as we're entering into the, uh, uh, the announcement to Miriam or Mary, then uh, it says that Elizabeth will be uh, six months already uh, with, with child. Okay, so for uh, those of you, I'm going to start putting pages. So if I, if I remember to do this, I'll do that to help you out. On page 38 of your book, then you'll be able to, to know where we're starting. This is the Annunciation or the announcement of Yeshua's birth to Miriam. If you see the word Miriam here, don't be alarmed. That is what they would have called her. Uh, Mary comes down the line and to translate into English as Mary, but it, it would be a, a Jewish name. Miriam is, is very common. Uh, in fact, if you remember Miriam from uh, Moses' sister is named Miriam. She could have been called Mary, you know, by the standards as well. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38. Also, I want you to remember what we have over here. Here we have Matthew. He's relating to all the things that have to do with the, the Jewishness and, and Jesus as king. Mark is relating to the Roman authorities or to the Roman people and their thought process of, of action. That's why, that's why you'll see a lot of action takes place in Mark's account. In Luke, where we're going to be at, that is more of a Greek mindset and it's more of details about how things work. And it also relates to a lot of, uh, of the chronological order and about mankind, Jesus as a man. So here this is why he takes the time to go through all the process and then in John it's over pretty much uh, it's about the whole world 
uh, and uh, he, li he likes to talk about light and darkness, and also he talks about the deity of the Lord. And this is, that's John 1.1 1, 1, where we talked about that earlier. So in, in Luke, he wants to emphasize uh, the, the child, how it's all going to work out, and, and so he gives that. He will do it from uh, Miriam's point of view, and uh, where Matthew will talk about Joseph and uh, his point of view. So either one, you'll notice that like with uh, Luke, he'll mention everything there is to know about Mary's side, but then uh, Matthew just takes, it just, just it does not include Mary at all because it's kind of like, okay, that, that's going to be taken care of or something, you know, but he just deals with the, the Joseph during this time. So here's the account. I'm going to read it through and just kind of go over Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary or Miriam, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying, his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be, his name shall be called Jesus, or Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is, in, who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And I guess that's the theme of these two ladies, of Elizabeth and of Miriam. It's that the, with God, nothing is impossible. You have two basic impossibilities taking place here. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So there's a few things that we need to understand about this story. If you start to... Well, well first of all, I get really upset about about believers who, in an attempt to uh, rectify anything that's going on with Mary and the, uh, and the, and any uh, untruths that go along with Mary of who she is and so forth, you usually find in, in, in Catholicism, then what they do is they almost tear down the person of Mary <laughs> in order to be able to get there. In other words, kind of this, no, she was this, or this was that, trying to kind of bring her, bring her down to a certain extent. But the Word of God doesn't do that. The Word of God really actually goes the opposite. The Word of God really shows how wonderful Mary is, or Miriam is, to be able to deal with the information she's about to get, and also to deal with the rest of the information she's going to be getting as she's rearing the Son of God. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of information that's going to be processing that she's going to have to process. But you never get the, you never, if you just think about it, you don't ever get the, uh, the impression about Miriam that she's kind of like uh, totally scared or panicky or, or flustered or doesn't know what to do or you don't see her running around anywhere. I mean, it's just very, there's just something about her. There's a very strong spirit about her that, that, that takes in information and holds on to it. Doesn't react violently one way or another. Doesn't react in a panicking sort of way. But it's always it just... And in this case, even, even the answer that she, or the question that she gives to, uh, uh, to the angel Gabriel is not of, well, how in the world are you going to do this? Is it possible? Or, you, you know, no, I'm, I don't even know a man, this type of thing. But not from a negative point of view. It was more of, okay, this is going to happen. Can you just give me the details as to how it's going to happen? 
not questioning the ability of God to be able to make it happen, just questioning the idea of, well, I just need the details as to how it's going to happen. So in essence, she's already kind of signed off on the idea, which to me is pretty awesome that a person can get this type of information and just be able to hold on to it and to process it the way she did. And so we're not talking about somebody in her 40s or, or in her 30s. We're talking about a young girl, probably right around 16 years old, 17 years old. Now you tell me how many 17 or 16 year olds can process information that she's just gotten like that. And usually it's, 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 it, it, you're, it's a very difficult, um, it's, it's just, you have to really give props to the person who can have this type of temperament and the type of person that would have the type of love for God that she has for God because she's willingly accepting something that's a very difficult concept. Now just think about several things, okay? And we're going to go over it in a second, but just kind of I want to just paint a picture so that you, as we go through it, you have a better understanding of, of kind of what she's going through. Understand that the information that she's getting, that first of all, there's, there's number one is that she's already betrothed. She's already engaged. At this point in time, when the angel Gabriel is talking to her, she's already engaged. And we're going to go over the idea of what that means. But very simply, engagement was the first part of marriage. In other words, when you got engaged, it was you were already set aside and you were already married, so to speak. In fact, if you wanted to get out of that agreement, you had to get a divorce just to be able to get out of the engagement. If you were engaged to a guy and he dies, you would be considered a widow because of that type of thing. If the, so there's the, and if you break, if you break that with infidelity, if while you're engaged and you have and you're, you, you, you go a fool around with some other guy or whatever, then what happens is that at that point in time, then they can go ahead and stone you to death in front of in front of the, in, in your hometown or he can divorce you and, t and, and make a big scene and or he can divorce you quietly. But the bottom line is you could not go through the process. And not only would it be, uh, it, it, even if you got divorced quietly, you're probably never going to be able to live in that, in, that, uh, in that town anymore. And then your reputation would be gone. And so there's all this negativity. This is all information that she would have already known. She already knows the process of engagement. She knows how it all works. And now she's being told by an angel that she's about to have a child out of wedlock. Not, well, not out of wedlock, but not, not in the normal way. And now it doesn't really matter because if she has a baby, it's a baby. And no one has ever heard of having a child and not having uh, a man involved in that process. So this is like, how do you explain that away? How do you even talk to anybody about that? Think about the position that she's in, because as she's being told, the first reaction would have been, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. Why? Because if I do that, then nobody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to, you know, just think about the, the, what's going to happen to my family. Think about how, they, how we're, you know, be ostracized. We're going to have to move out somewhere else. We're going to, and just down the list is, is the panic. That would be the panic mode. And it would be, man, they thought, you know, Zachariah had no questions by comparison to the questions that she would have. At least with Zachariah, okay, you're old, but, eh, well, okay, maybe it was a fluke or whatever, okay? But here, there is nowhere to go with this. And so she's being told this information, and now she has to process that. And in this course of this conversation, she only asks the question as to, okay, so how is this going to happen? With the understanding that if this is what God wants, then 
I will consider it an honor and a privilege to do it. This is a 16-year-old girl. What kind of great relationship does she have with God as her Savior? You know, I, I, she, she's, and, and she understands the whole process. She's, she's, she's surprised that God even chose her. So she wasn't looking because she said, well, I am pretty good at this. I, I have been a good girl. And, you know, I'm, I'm a better girl than the rest of the girls, so I can see how God could choose me. No, it had nothing to do with that. In fact, it had nothing to do with anything that she had done. This was God giving her a, the gift, the favor, giving her the gift that she would be able to do this particular job. But her heart is really good. And God chose the right person for this. But the second that we take her and elevate her to God's status, that's when it gets really wily. And this is where it gets crazy because it's unbiblical. It's traditional, I get it, but it's not biblical. And so what we have to do is look at who Mary is biblically and then go with that version, which is a really godly young lady who has the ability to process very heavy truths better than Zechariah, who's older, a priest, uh, and you know working as a Levitical priesthood, and 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 you would think that his understanding or his faith would be that much more, you know, mature. And yet this little girl seems to be doing really well with this. And she's willing to take on all the stigma that goes along with this. So this is all what's taking place. All of this is moving down the line with her. And this is going to be very difficult. But we'll start off with uh, the first part of this. And that is, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now Gabriel has already been dispatched once before in Jerusalem at the temple. But now this time he's being dispatched by God to bring the message over to her hometown of Nazareth. Um, Nazareth is, uh, is right over where the Hula Valley, I'm sorry, where the uh, Valley of Jezreel or Armageddon is, uh, Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo or, or Jezreel. So Jesus will grow up in the backdrop. It's like, it's like Nazareth is right here and the valley is right here. So just imagine, kind of think about it. He's growing up overlooking the very place that the Antichrist later on is going to amass up his troops to be able to go and to try to defeat him. But then we find out that we read the, the back of the book and we win, or he wins. Okay? So now it's the sixth month, with the sixth month of Elizabeth uh, now having, uh, 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 starting off with the child. So, in verse 26, it states that in the sixth month, that is the sixth month after Elizabeth became pregnant with Yohanan, Gabriel, the same angel who had announced the birth of Yohanan to the baptizer to Zechariah, now announced the birth of Yeshua to Miriam, Jesus to Mary. At this point, Miriam was living in the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Verse 27, And it was to a virgin betrothed through a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Miriam. The passage clearly emphasizes that Miriam was a virgin. Now, very simply, all a virgin means is she had never known a man sexually. That's all that means, okay? It's nothing beyond that, okay? So then she was betrothed or engaged to Joseph, and as the betrothed of Joseph, she had a specific legal status. The Jewish marriage process involved two stages. The first stage is the engagement or betrothal. Legally, the woman now belonged to her husband-to-be and was called his wife. Though the second stage of the marriage process, the ceremony itself took place about a year later when the groom took her home. So usually these were arranged marriages, unless, of course, he, he saw her, liked her, and so forth, and talked to his dad and she talked to her dad, and they all talked. Well, then the dads take over, and they start figuring out what the dowry is going to be, how much is going to be paid, all these different things. And then also, 
while the process is being done, they go ahead and they, they basically do vows uh, of engagement. And that's what makes it formal, okay? And so at this point in time, she's taken. And so there'll be certain things that she wear in her, in, in the way she, she, she looks, uh, that says that she's taken, she's already taken for, and you, you can't be messing around with that girl. So uh, that's why, it, and there's, there's pretty much like an engagement ring. You, you look at engage, oh, you know, she's engaged and hands off type of thing. You know, don't do anything. So it's kind of the basic same thing. But well, what then happened is that the, the husband to be would say, okay, I'm now going to prepare a place. And so he would go back home and usually he would build it uh, on the property of his dad. That's usually where, it, where, where the house would be. He could have it in another location, but in most cases that was it. And usually it was like an addition that was being built to the big house there. That's why Mexicans love to have all their kids all together because it's kind of a Jewish Mexican thing, okay? And so um, then afterwards, at the end of the at the, at the uh, end of the year, uh, the son would would say, "Dad, it, do you think the, it's ready? Can I go get my bride?" So he goes and inspects, and he says, "Yeah, you've got your house is in order and everything." Yes, go and get your bride. So then as he goes, then he will go and she needs to be ready for the bridegroom and then he comes and then they have seven days of feasting uh, and drinking and it's just a really good time. A lot of accordion music and Tejano music. It's going to be just fantastic. And then after that, after the seventh day, then they actually uh, consummate the marriage. So that's what's happening, and so everything is in order. Everything is is, is in, in place. There's nothing to say that he that there's, it doesn't say that. And she loved Joseph very much, but it's kind of implied as you see their lives as they get, come together, and you see some of the reaction he's going to have, and so forth. So there's a this is a, a wonderful couple that that kind of in a sense a grenades being thrown in right in the middle of their relationship, and it is going to bust it wide open. Imagine all the conversations that are going to be had by the dads <laughs> with, with, either, with both of them and the moms and the cousins and everybody else. And so it's, and, and the thing about it is that Miriam shows herself to be very chaste. I mean, she's very, a very godly young woman who loves the Lord. So this doesn't make, this is not going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Okay? So, because of the legal aspects involved, Miriam's betrothal should not be thought of as an equivalent of a modern engagement of marriage. It was a very different arrangement. In the first century, girls as young as age 12 could have been bound that way to a man. Neither Matthew nor Luke spe uh, specify Miriam's exact age when she became engaged to Joseph. What is specified is the fact that she was a virgin. The Greek word for virgin Parthenos never refers to a married woman or one who is already engaged in sexual relations. To prove the bride's purity, a waiting period of one year before finalizing the marriage process was the norm. So part of that was that year process was basically is you wanted to make sure that there was no entanglements with the girl that you just got engaged with. And in due time, you would find out if she was entangled with anyone else, if she was pregnant. Okay, so then that gave it a time period where you could see that everything was fine, and it also gave it a period to see that she, was, uh, that she wasn't fooling around. Not much information is given about guys, except for the fact that if a guy comes and takes that girl and, uh, and has anything to do with that girl, then both of them, both the, uh, the other person uh, the other guy and the girl, both of them would be stoned to death. Okay, and so that was that was a penalty. So pretty much everybody stayed away from a girl that was like that. But that was also very important. Okay. So during this time, only death or divorce could sever the contract, and the girl whose groom died during this period of waiting was referred to as a widow. The marriage ceremony lasted for seven days and only afterwards was the marriage consummated. From the Gospel of John and the book of Acts, we know that Miriam was still alive when Yeshua was crucified. She would have been in her late 40s or early 50s. Just roughly speaking, if she was 50 years old and uh, 
then she would have been right around 17 years old is what she would she would be if she was younger than that then she could have been 15 years old okay we don't know exactly the, the numbers and i don't know how they know how old she was at the end during the crucifixion if you had an exact name a number there then you would know exactly how old she was but anyway just stop to think about this tremendous huge bomb of information coming into you and then processing it the way she did. It's pretty amazing. This girl, yeah, I like this girl. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing is the angel's message. And having come in and, and the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So in verse 28, the angel greeted Miriam with the words, Hail, you are the... you." You that are highly favored, the Lord is with you. In Greek, highly favored is that word, which comes from the root charitu. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I just try to say that in a Greek emphasis. <laughs> charito, <laughs> like as if I knew what I was talking about. Meaning, I bestow freely on, I favor. The idea here is that he is putting favor on her. He's not rewarding her by doing a favor for her because of who she is or anything, this is a gift that's being given to her. In other words, we can't work for our salvation. It is a gift of God, God's favor upon our lives, not based on how good we are or how bad we are. It is God's favor. That's the way it works. And that's where we find here. The verb is used twice in the New Testament here in Luke and in Ephesians 1.6. And both times it speaks of God extending himself to freely bestow grace or favor upon someone. So the angel greeted Miriam and referred to her as one who had received special grace from God. And she would soon be told the special grace was that she had been chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. She was being favored by God. She was receiving his grace. Yet there is nothing in the text that even remotely implies that she herself was sinless. Miriam was a humble sinner, a truth she herself acknowledged when she said, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. In just a few more verses down the line, we're going to have the Mary's uh, uh, hymn that she, that she speaks out. And there she expresses the fact that she, is, she as a sinner is in need of a Savior. And that's really important because what's happened now is it's morphed into uh, the heresy that, that, that she was sinless and that somehow God made her to take, put her in a position where she didn't have any more sin or she moved up in rank to the point where she, was no longer, she no longer had any sin. But Mary was always just what she was, uh, a young girl who by virgin was, who had not known anybody another man, and who was bestowed by God this privilege. Now, I get it. God is going out, going out to choose somebody that he wants to choose, and he has chosen her as this particular person. But I think it has a lot, to, probably has a lot to do with the fact of her demeanor, her ability to, to take in all of this information. This is, this is really a heavy thing to do, to put on anybody, anybody. But then a young girl is like, wow, this is just pretty amazing. So that's what you have. But you don't have where she no longer is, or where she became sinless. She continued to be, be a sinner just like everyone else was. But she had a savior. And she understood that. So it says, only a sinful person needs a redeemer. So clearly Miriam was not sinless from her conception as some teach. Therefore, when God called Miriam to become the mother of the Messiah... He enabled her to take on this role and his choice of Miriam was rooted in his grace. God did not act because of her, but on behalf of her and basically bestowed this, this privilege upon her. In verse 29 says, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. In other words, why are you calling me favored? What, why would you say that? And considered what manner of greeting this was. According to verse 29, Miriam was greatly troubled at the saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this might be. 
In fact, it was like, I'm really confused. Why would you consider me to be favored? And as, as opposed to, well, of course I'm favored. Of course I, know I'm, I, I belong to God. And, and, you know, none of that stuff. She was like, wow, that's nice of you to say that, but why would you say that about me? That's only humble people would say that. <laughs> Prideful people would say, you know, you're right. You're right, angel. You know, you're absolutely right. I am that person that's highly favored. But that's not the case, and that's kind of cool. So, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Miriam, for you have found favor with God. The angel calmed her fears by telling her again that she had found favor with God. Then he delivered God's message to her, and it contains five specific points the virgin birth and behold you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son this is kind of a very this if you're listening to this for the first time this has got to be just really heavy so the angel did not mention Joseph nor did he mention marriage and from Miriam's response in Luke 134 it's clear that she understood what he was declaring she would conceive and bear a son in her virgin state the meaning of Genesis 3.15 and Isaiah's prophecy of the virgin conception and the birth in Isaiah 7.14 now became clear. This is also really good. Remember how the people who read the Bible, the people who are in the Word of God, they know what the prophecies are all about. Why? Because they've read it. Now somebody probably could have just skipped all that information but it gives you the impression that Mary or Miriam actually had read this particular verses. So that when she's being told this information, she's making the connection. Oh yeah, I remember in Isaiah talking about this, that a virgin was going to give birth and all this. And kind of like makes that connection of, well, that's who he's talking. He's, wait a minute, he's talking about me. Wow. And at that time, why doesn't it say here that she jumps up and runs around the room and everything? And I, just, just, <laughs> I don't get it. I would do that. Okay. So that, that's why I didn't become the, the mother of Messiah. <laughs> so then, so now it became clear. There's two verses here. Genesis 3.15 had always given the promise from the very beginning that out of the seed of a woman would come the Messiah. And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed, the Antichrist, and her seed. So then, the Messiah. So that was, that was something that, 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 had, that she could have easily have read and knew. And you shall bruise his head, and, you, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the what? The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Anybody know what the word Emmanuel means? God is with us. That's right. It's more of, everybody says, but wait a minute, his name is Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I know. But his, his uh, title is God is with us, Emmanuel. So that's one of his titles. But here's a perfect situation where here you have a godly young girl who knows her scripture, who could make the connection while nobody else seems to be thinking about it or understanding it and so forth. Uh, Herod, the king, doesn't even know that there's going to be uh, any birth in Bethlehem because he's not up with everything. The Pharisees are so wrapped up in traditions that they're not looking because all they had to do was look at Daniel chapter 9 is it chapter 9 I think it is Daniel, uh, Daniel, to know what the timetable was going to be for the birth of Messiah but I think this girl made the connection so she's also a very smart girl <laughs> along with a lot of things if she made that that means that she was in the word of God and would have made the connection with this verse. It was already out there. And now she's filling in the blanks and she's saying, behold, I'm going to conceive and bear a son and his name is going to be Emmanuel. Wow, that's awesome, right? 
I never thought about that. I'll be honest with you. I was looking at them and be like, oh, of course. We forget that there's information that's already there. There's information in Daniel to tell you exactly when the birth is going to happen. There's all this informa that, there's information about all the, the different things about who Messiah was going to be. But in this case, this is tailor-made. This scripture was made for her. So she's fulfilling the scripture that Isaiah wrote about hundreds of years before. That's awesome. I mean, that's really good. God would become incarnate. He was going to become a man in the person of Yeshua, the son of Miriam, the Messiah's name. And he shall, and, and his, and, and, and shall call his name Jesus. That's the name that you are to call. Gabriel does two things. He names the kids for them. Nobody, nobody has to, this kind of need. You don't have to worry about going through the whole role of all the names of, of figuring out, you know, uh, to, what, what you're going to name a child. John is already already prescribed. Yohanan, that's that's going to be your kid's name. You know, here, uh, Jesus, that's going to be your child's name. And so that's done. There's a reason for it because God wants to make sure that the information of who the, na the name of Jesus and what he's going to do are going to be linked together forever. So every time we say Jesus or Yeshua, we're saying something, the meaning. The angel's second point pertained to her son's name. Miriam was to call him Yeshua. His actual name comes from a Hebrew root that means to save salvation. The very name of Jesus is salvation. I can't, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this is great, right? It's just so awesome. And it says, or Savior. To save salvation or Savior. It is akin to the Hebrew word for salvation, Yeshua. As Joseph would also be told, the child was to have the name Yeshua, salvation, because he would, Yoshia, save his people from their sins. In Matthew, on giving the account, he says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So that's where he, in Matthew, it's talking to Joseph about this. Okay? The same root is in the origin of other names, such as Joshua, like my Joshua, Isaiah, and Hosea. And Joshua's back there going like, why does he do this? Why? The next one we talk about, he, say, he says, and he shall be great. I like that. He will be great. This is the third point of the angel's message was as, as to his essential nature, Miriam's son, shall be great. Great in every possible way. Great as a teacher. Great as a friend. Great as, a, as, as, as the, one of the greatest rabbis that, could, that, that will ever live. But then also great as a sacrifice. Great in humility that he's going to put himself in this position. We're in the book of, uh, in end times, in the book of Revelation, and we talked a little bit about the difference in the, the, the portrayal of, of King Jesus with the fiery eyes and the, and, 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 and the, the sharp, two-edged sharp knife coming out of his, his tongue and all this really powerful, powerful God. And, and, and we find that that's, that's the that's the king that hid all of that and and wrapped himself in 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 human clothes and is willing to go through the process as a child and all the way through so it says Miriam's son shall be great his talking about his deity and he will be called the son of the highest Gabriel's fourth fourth point was that the Messiah would be called the son of the Most High. Miriam's son, Yeshua, will not be merely a man. He will be the God-man. At the moment of conception, the second person of the Trinity will add to his divine nature a human nature, thus becoming the biological descendant of Adam, Abraham, and David. He's the fulfiller of the Davidic covenant. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, 
and his kingdom, there will be no end. This is what the millennial temple is all about. It's about Jesus reigning on the earth, on the throne of David. Okay? This is kind of a neat thing. Uh, the angel's fifth point pertained to the Davidic covenant. In this covenant, God promised David four specific things. An eternal throne, an eternal house or dynasty, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal descendant. He would settle his des this descendant in his house and in his kingdom forever, and he would call him his son. According to Gabriel's message, Miriam's son is the one who will fulfill all four aspects of the Davidic covenant. He would be the promised seed of David, and he should be called the son of the Most High, and he will be given David's throne. He will rule over the house of Yaakov, Jacob, forever, and his kingdom will have no end says, Gabriel promised Miriam that the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. This means that her son would fulfill two requirements given in the Hebrew Bible for kingship. He is a descendant of David apart from Jeconiah. Do you understand what I just said? If you did, I'm so proud of you. We looked at the genealogies and we found out that he had to come through the, the line of Nathan, not Solomon, but Nathan, because the land, it, the the, the the power to have kings stops at Jeconiah by way of Solomon. But by way of Nathan, which is Mary's uh, genealogy, it can, goes right through. So it bypasses Jeconiah and allows you to be able to, to flow straight through to Jesus. So then, um, and, him, and he is being divinely appointed to be king over Israel. When Gabriel said, the Lord God shall give him the throne, Yeshua received this divine appointment. It should be mentioned that the Messiah is the only one who fulfills both of the requirements of the Hebrew Bible for kingship. And he, by virtue of his resurrection, now lives forever. There will be no need for a successor. I like that. There's no talk about anybody succeeding or going after Jesus as far as sitting on the throne of David. It's done. Because Jesus was resurrected, he became the king, had the kingship, was resurrected, and now lives forever. Because of that, he, is, he remains then the king over that. So right now, his position is that of priest for us because he's, he's interceding for us and he's become a high priest. But he already has the kingship already sealed in that when he got it, back then at his birth then from that point on he just remains as the king his resurrection making it eternal makes it that it's an eternal possession eternal kingdom that's why when he goes you, when you get to this point in in history down the line of the millennial kingdom for a thousand years he, there is no question as to who rules that's already been taken care of 2000 years ago at his birth Amen? It's kind of neat. I love this stuff. How it all works. It all works together, right? Isn't it amazing how it actually works all together if we just know what, what the information is. Okay. So concerning the house or dynasty, Gabriel stated that the Messiah would reign over the house of Yaakov or Jacob forever. Concerning the kingdom, it would have no end. And concerning the eternal descendant, Gabriel referred to Yeshua as the son of the Most High and the Son of God declaring him divine and thus eternal. These four eternal aspects of the Davidic covenant are here restated and promised to be fulfilled through Yeshua the Messiah. The eternality of the house, throne, and kingdom is guaranteed because the seed of David culminates in a person who himself is eternal, the God-man. That's why you don't ever have to look for a king outside of Jesus because he is God and man, and therefore he is the, the God-man, king, priest, prophet. He has all of those positions. Miriam's question then comes up. So after she gets told this information, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? So this is not a question of, ah, this can't happen. This is not possible. That was, that was uh, Zachariah. In this case, she said, okay, I would like to know the details. How does this happen? How does this work? Because 
this is the first time it's ever happened in the history of mankind. <laughs> no, there is no, there's no other way. You don't, un, you don't know what that is. How many of y'all have had uh, children, even if it's just one? How many of you knew what to do with that first child? It was like, <laughs> yeah, it was just the Wild West trying to figure it out, right? Because that's just the way it is. You're first of anything. But this is really the first of all time. Of, this, this has never happened before. And so how do you go about doing it? So ask yourself, if you're Miriam, wouldn't you kind of want to know? Okay, so tell me, how does this work? And... I would be all ears. Well, I'd be running around the place all over the place and crazy and panicky. But nevertheless, if, if I had, con by the time I came into control, I, the question would be is, well, yeah, well, how does this, how is this going to work? You see, no, you, we all have that information. Well, the Holy Spirit's going to come down. Oh, I'm Miriam. I, of course, it's going to be easy. The Holy Spirit comes down and it's going to be fine. But she's getting, she hasn't gotten that information yet. So she, what's going in her mind? Um, okay, I get the concept. I understand that I'm going to conceive a child, but I'm not, I, how does that happen? How, I, just, I just need to know how, to, how, how will that work? And it's a legitimate question. Because, I mean, you start thinking about it, if you just had some enough work, say for instance, if the angel left and said, I'll be back tomorrow, and I'll give you more information. <laughs> what would your night be like? What would you be thinking? Well, could it be like this? And it could be, uh, so I have like 10,000 scenarios, Joshua and I have 10,000 scenarios about anything and everything. And it's like, you know, uh, I wonder if, if uh, we should get rid of our cat or not. <laughs> and so he has all the scenarios of how to get rid of my cat. <laughs> And I have all the scenarios of how to prevent him from <laughs> getting rid of my cat. But you just think about all the scenarios that this she, she would have had all that time. But there's this kind of like it's, 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 all, it's all coming together in, in, in one encounter right here. And so she's asking the question, okay, how, how is this going to happen? At this point, Miriam raised the question, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? Zachariah's question was different. Whereby shall I know, th shall, shall I know this? His question arose out of unbelief. Miriam, however, did not challenge the angel's word. Her question was not, how will I know what, that this is true? She asked, how is this going to come to pass? What is the method that God is going to use for that to happen? This is telling me that she's already come to that point of acceptance, and now she just wants to know. The answer is yes. Now, how will we do that? That's just awesome to be able to come up with that answer so quickly. She's already bought in. What? This is really a, a young girl who has, I just, I just have to think that she's rooted in God's word, has had a great relationship with God, trusts God, and has been living a life of dependency on God. And that her family brought her up really good. You don't hear too much about the parents of, of, of Miriam, but man, I'm going like, man, praise God, whoever the dad was and whoever the, the mom was, this, this family that she grew up in, they did their job. They put together a young girl who, who knows her scripture, who is dependent on the Lord, and who was willingly accepting what God had for her. You know, there's things that have happened in my life that it's taken me years to accept or to understand or to become dependent on God for a particular thing. And that's because I'm not in practice. If I was dependent on the Lord for everything on a daily basis, whatever would come down the line wouldn't affect me nearly as bad as it does. But when we're not prepared then you can see how we're devastated, we have anxiety, we have fear, we have we, we're, we panic, all these things take place. But the secret of this young girl is that she had already established a dependence on God and said, if that's what God wants, 
then he'll have to figure out all the other issues that are out there. And how are we going to do this? Golly, man. See, I wish, I wish the people would focus on this part of her dependence on God. Not in exalting her to somebody that's equal with God. But a person who was dependent on God. That's so powerful. It says here, uh, it, is, it is a logical question. How would this happen in light of the fact that she was a virgin? The angels answer. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest sh will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So he says, basically the Holy Spirit will take care of it. And you, don't worry, he is very capable of making sure that everything goes smooth. In verse 35, Gabriel answered a question. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Wherefore also the holy thing which is begotten, it's funny they, they call it the holy thing in, in some versions, but the holy one which is begotten shall be called the Son of God. Because of what is said here, a common misconception has risen that there must be dispelled. Some teach that the virgin birth was necessary to keep the Messiah from inheriting the sin nature. This teaching is based upon the false assumption that the sin nature is transmitted only through the Father. However, the sin nature is actually transmitted through both the father and the mother. And nowhere in the Bible does it ever say that the sin nature is transmitted through the male seed. Sometimes the Bible even emphasizes the influence of the female side over the male side. For example, in Psalm 51, David said, And in my sin did my mother conceive me. It literally, it re in reality, the sin nature is transmitted through both the father and the mother. So what protected the Messiah from inheriting the sin nature of Miriam? the overshadowing work of the Holy Spirit. The work, this work protected Yeshua from inheriting the sin nature of man. So that was the job of the Holy Spirit, to keep the line absolutely clean as it, as it pertained to Jesus. God's omnipotence would have allowed him to produce an absolutely sinless being by normal human conception using both male sperm and female egg. However, he chose to do it another way. The reason the Messiah was conceived in a virgin's womb was not that God had no other options. The reason was that this was the way he had chose to make, to take on human form. By choosing to do it this way, he would also fulfill his prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, hinted at Genesis 3.15, and clearly stated in Isaiah 7.14, which we already talked about. The, the Messiah would be conceived in the womb of a virgin, and his birth would provide him with the unique credentials. The angel went on to explain that because of the overshadowing work of the Holy Spirit, he who was conceived would be holy, that is, sinless. So the person who is sinless is Jesus. It's not Mary. Okay? Furthermore, he would be called the Son of God. And now to finish off, it says, Now indeed, the, uh, Gabriel say, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Everybody say this. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And that's something that we could learn from this lesson. This is an impossibility. This should never be able to work any other way except for the fact that God is in control. And he knows exactly what to do. How many of you have come across problems that you feel are impossible. There's no way it's ever going to work out and you worry about it and sometimes you panic about it. I'm going to raise my hand, okay, to be the first one out there because I have done that. I have forgotten how fantastic my God is. I have forgotten that while it is impossible for me, it is very possible for God. And sometimes God shuts my mouth up when those things that I said would never happen, God produces it, and I have nothing to say except for, I didn't see that coming. Thank you, Lord. I just, now, I just realized now that I left you out of the equation. But if I would have put you in the equation, it would have been so much better. I would have had so much dependence on you that I would have believed that anything is possible. 
That doesn't mean that we name it and claim it and then that's, that's it, it has to happen, no. It just means that we should have the, the ability to come to the point of dependence and faith to believe that, look, this might be impossible for me, but with God, nothing is impossible. So if God says yes, praise God. If God says no, praise God. And if God says wait, praise God. He knows what he's doing. He has my best interest in mind, but I'm not going to shut him down and say he can't do it. Of course, if what you're asking for is unbiblical and it's the worst thing ever, then I would suggest that you know, you'd know better than to ask for that. So I, I really am in love with her. I know she's married and she's had five kids. I know that, but, but I'm in love. Well, then God, could you make her, you know, divorce her husband and then fall in love with me <laughs> and then we can run away together? <laughs> That's not a good. That's not a good prayer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I can t I can tell you <laughs> what that answer should be <laughs> from God. <laughs> and sometimes we say, Nah, never mind. I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. Unfortunately, that's what happens. No, if if you have something and you have a, a desire, I have a we you Josh and I we have a desire to <laughs> to populate the world with postcards, <laughs> the whole world. <laughs> Now you say, well, that's not possible. You can't even do it in San Antonio, much less Texas or much less the whole world. I said, that may be true, but who knows? With God, anything's possible, right? So we let, we find out, well, God, you have a, you have something for us. That'd be good. My dad's property, will it ever sell? Okay, that is impossible. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. Amen? Nothing is impossible with the Lord. I like that. This whole idea that at the end, he just has to say that. Let me finish off. Gabriel further told Miriam that her cousin Elizabeth was also with child and already six months along. This sets the stage for the next section. Miriam's departure to the hill country of Judah to see Elizabeth. This is her response. And here is the big finale. After all of that, then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord. Behold, the servant of the Lord. You're looking at a person who's depending on the Lord to do what he wants with me. That is powerful. It says, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God. Having received the prophecy and the answer to her subsequent question, the passage ends with Miriam's response. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. At this point, Miriam totally submits herself to the will and care of God. This was wise in light of three things. First, under the Mosaic law, if a betrothed woman was found to be pregnant, the penalty she faced was execution by lapidation or stoning. Miriam would have to, to trust that God would protect her from such a horrible fate. Second, she had to trust God concerning the reaction of the community. Or when it was known that she was pregnant, she would have been in danger of being expelled from the community and of being ostracized for the rest of her life. Third, she had to trust the Lord concerning her relationship to Joseph. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a righteous man and that he did contemplate divorcing her when it was found out that she was pregnant. She gave herself over to the Lord completely and trusted him to work out all of these important details. Golly, man. What an awesome, awesome story. I finished with something that I just, I keep saying the word finished, right? And then I don't finish. Have you noticed that? Golly. Sorry. Sorry. I really like this. Um, it says, this young maiden was never meant to be a disperser of the grace she had received. The fact that God suddenly and without forewarning stepped into her life to bring her into his service utterly surprised her. If we were looking to her for anything, it's her reaction, her reaction to his call. If you want to look at something about Mary and admire something about Mary, it's her reaction to his call. Bach notes, she should be honored for her model of faithfulness. 
and openness to serve God. But that does not mean she was to be worshipped. Luke wants to identify with Miriam's example, not to unduly exalt her person. And that's the whole point. To show this whole thing is to show what is it, what's it like, what does it look like to be so dependent that when you get this type of information, you react in a dependent way before the Lord. Amen? I want to finish off with an admonition. This is just kind of an encouragement. If you've never come to know the Lord, whether you're sitting here or you're looking at this on the video, if you've never had a relationship with the Lord, I'm just pleading with you, please consider doing that. The benefits are actually really out of this world. They're in a place called heaven. This gold page represents heaven and it, it says in, in Revelation 21, it calls the streets, the streets of gold. Heaven is, is, is a place that's paved with gold. It's paved with the most beautiful of architecture and, and gems and everything else. But that's not what makes heaven beautiful. What makes heaven beautiful and awesome and outstanding and fantastic is the fact that that's where, that's where God lives. And God wants us to have a relationship with him in order to be able to be with him when we die. The Bible clearly says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if heaven is an absolutely perfect place, then that just means that all we have to be is perfect. That's it. That means you can't have sinned one, not at any point of your life. All it takes is one sin to be imperfect. If heaven is a perfect place and we have to be perfect, that presents a problem. The problem that we have is this next page, the darkened page. It represents our darkened hearts as a result of sin. In this, it's in this condition that all of us as sinners find ourselves. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Have you ever stolen anything like a paper clip, a pen? That's a sin. Have you ever lied? A small lie, big lie, doesn't matter. Just one lie. That's a sin. Have you ever wanted what somebody else uh, has that's a sin have you ever thought of everybody else except for God that's a sin all of these things if you've just done one of these it puts us all in the same boat we're all doomed to perish in a place called hell and then later to be transferred to a place called the lake of fire but God doesn't want that to happen so what he did is he has a, a, he's resolved the problem, the biggest problem ever, and that is the red page. The red page represents the shed blood of Jesus. The Bible gives us the answer to our problem. Our problem is that we're going to perish unless somebody saves us. Jesus is that Savior. He's the one that went to the cross and took our sins, my sins and your sins, and took it upon himself and paid the penalty so that we wouldn't have to. So in John 3.16, it says, For God the Father loved the world, you and me, so much that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever, me or you, whoever believes in him should not perish or go to the lake of fire for eternity, but have everlasting life instead. God wants you to have a relationship with him. In a simple prayer, ask the Lord to come into your life. Jesus said, just so that you're clear about this, Jesus said that he was the only way for salvation. These are his words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except by me. Those are his words. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I now understand that I'm a sinner. And now I just understood that if I die in my sin, I will have to go to the lake of fire for eternity, never to be in your presence. 
but I also understand now that you, Jesus, paid the price for me. And if I accept this free gift of eternal life, of what you've done, then I can have a relationship with you. And since you are the way, the truth, and the life, I can go to be in heaven, to be absent from the body, to be present with you in heaven. I ask you now, wash me clean of all of my sin. I ask you now to come into my life. I believe that you are the only way for my salvation. I believe that you died on the cross, that you were buried, and you rose again on the third day. That is the good news, the gospel. And I believe that, and I put my faith in you and you alone for my salvation. I'm not going to put my faith in you and in someone else. I'm only going to put my faith in you alone for my salvation. And for those of us that are here, dear Lord, I just ask that we would just be mindful that whatever goes on in our lives, that you can always resolve any situation because nothing is impossible for you. And that we need to live our lives dependent on you that so whenever we get any information that we can react in a way that will bring you honor glory and praise we love you lord we thank you lord for all that you're doing now in jesus powerful name we do pray and all of god's people said amen, amen. god bless you guys